Malo Lire and greetings from the land of the uh, Wurundjeri people. I want to present a, a short presentation on uh, reading Ruth with Native Islander eyes. Native, what do I mean by Native? A Native is someone who kind of looks like me. And I'm not a very good example of what it means to be a Native, but you know, my kind of features, brownish, islandish, uh, look and um, this presentation is is my attempt to is my invitation for you to I don't know how many of you are native people uh, but uh, invitation for you to to think and consider the possibility uh, that you too could could uh, learn to read uh, not through your only not only through your eyes as you prefer, but also through the eyes of others, including natives. And here, natives is about Pacific Islanders, but uh, it could also apply to indigenous people. Um, indigenous, they, they, they have a, a preference uh, for neighbors, but, um, but that's up to them if they want to adopt this native way of looking. Why native? Uh, I've chosen to use native in a way as a is my way of talking back to colonialists who came to our islands and did not recognize the presence of native people. Uh, we were there, or our ancestors were there, our four parents were there, but they did not see them. Empty, empty islands, empty lands. Same story in the region of Pacifica as in. Uh, uh, Australia. So this is my way of saying, actually, you know, look at us. Don't, don't, uh, don't ignore us. We were there when you arrived. Talking back to colonialists, talking back also to missionaries who came. They saw our people, and they said that our people were pagans, uh, people of the dark, people of darkness, of dark cultures. So this is talking back to missionaries as well, the mission attitude. Talking back also to scholars, especially anthrop anthropologists, who also saw our people, but proclaimed them as savages. So this is my affirmation of native is about those who don't recognize or appreciate our, our native ways, our native insights. But it's also talking back to some of our own people who we call fear palangi. They would rather be white rather than native. Uh, they would rather be European, uh, European clothes, European food, European language, European way of thinking. So it's not just talking back to non-natives, but to some natives who, are, who think that they are too good to be natives. The native world of Pacifica, as most of you know, uh, is we are surrounded by water, by the sea, by Moana. Our world is a water world. We live in a water world. And because we are surrounded by, wa by water, we, our way of thinking is shaped by our context. Our context is fluid. Our minds are similarly fluid. Part of our fluid culture is what uh, scholars call oral cultures. But orality is not limited just to stories or legends or myths. Orality is about artwork as well. Orality is about relationships. It's about reciprocity and, and other elements of, the, of our culture. But I want to, to focus on Talanoa. It's one of the words that circulates around Samoa, Fiji, Tonga, Tuvalu, uh, Rarotonga, to an extent. I mean, it's, it's known in the region. And this one word has three meanings. It, it means stories. When you have a story, you have a talanoa. When you tell stories, you talanoa the stories. And when you have conversation around the stories, you are holding a talanoa. So one word with three meanings. But this is what story weaving is about. So this, this, uh, 
this way of thinking, this Talanoa has applied applies to the Bible as well. Every text is a Talanoa, including poems, poems, songs. They are Talanoa. They tell stories. They have conversation, and there is no one story. Every text has multiple stories. It's already flowing into it. And every text is telling multiple stories all at, at the same time. And as readers, we bring stories as well to our understanding of the biblical text. So this is the native eyes that I'm, I'm presenting in this uh, presentation is about Talanoa. I'm focusing on the book of Ruth and the inside I'm sharing come out of uh, a project that I'm working on, Losing Ground, Ruth in a, a Changing Climate. It's, it's reading the story of Ruth in the context of climate change. Um, what I've done in this project is to go around Pacific Islands uh, and do Bible studies, go for about two weeks each time. Bible studies with natives and their insights I use as I bring in to inform my reading of, of the book of Ruth. So this is a, a native way of doing research. Instead of going to a library, uh, I'm going to local communities and running Bible studies. And I'll share some of those insights in this presentation but in order for you to have a, a good feel for for this uh, presentation i hope you have an understanding of the book of ruth uh, i have structured them this is the structure that i'm following in my project but give you an idea of how I, uh, the natives are reading this particular uh, book if you're not familiar please maybe this is a point where you can pause and and pick up your bible it's only four chapters give it a read I sent um, through Norm and his team the link to this overview of Ruth. Um, it's a it's a Christian oriented, a Christ oriented uh, overview, but it gives you a feel for the whole four chapters. So if you are able to read the text and then look at this overview, but uh, be mindful that every reader reads a text from a particular. Uh, with particular interest, particular uh, concern. There's no innocent reader, including natives, especially natives. Natives are never innocent. Well, that's me saying that. Uh, but it goes back to what Jason was uh, had said in his, in his presentation, uh, that people wrote the Bible so the, the interests of humans influence, their interests influence what they wrote. Readers are humans, our human interests influence what we see. I want to add to that, you know, we are all from the human species, we are all from the human race, but there are different shades in our race, in our human race. They are black, they're brown, they're white, they're pink, they're red, they're yellow and so forth different shades, different races, multiple races. And from our races, our ethnic standing, we see the text, we see the Bible in different, in particular ways because of where we are coming from in our interests. So I'm, what I'm presenting here is the native interest or my version of native interest. And by native, I'm referring to Pacifica. There are natives everywhere. They're native in South America, natives in, in Africa. Go to Europe, there are people there who claim to be natives as well, indigenous people, uh, like the Sami, for example. But at least uh, when you, when you, if you are able to watch this uh, YouTube uh, overview, be mindful of where the, the, that um, overview is coming from. Be mindful also of where I'm coming from as a native. What I want to do is to present five questions, five of the questions that the, that the Bible studies had raised for me. And this is the first one. How wealthy was Elimelech and his family? The text don't explain. The text has, doesn't explain what they, what they were like. But for the, for the natives, Elimelech must have been a health, wealthy person that he was able to get up because it's people who 
people who have wealth, they are the ones who migrate. Those with no wealth are stuck where they are. And people migrate because they have, they are able to afford, they, they can afford the journey. They have people to help. If you look at Abraham, for example, in Genesis 12, when he came to Canaan, he had what the text identifies as the people he had acquired in Haran. For natives, he had slaves. He was a slave owner. He came with wealth. So they are wondering, was Elimelech also wealthy? And if, since they have property, I mean, you go uh, fast forward to chapter four, uh, they had inheritance, there's, in, there's property. So the question that comes up is, with whom did Elimelech leave the family home and property? And for natives throughout uh, uh, my, my series of Bible studies, um, they assume that he must have left maybe with a brother, maybe with an uncle, maybe with the elder of the family, maybe with, but he would have left it with someone. And that reminded me of, uh, for example, when, when the people of Palestine, after the war in 1967, um, when they were pushed out of their homes or displaced, one of the two things that they were, uh, they were important for them to carry were the key to their house and uh, the deed that gave them the, the, uh, the right to their land as reminders of where they have come from. So did Elimelech have something similar when he and his family left? When Naomi started the return, this is an important question. How far were they from their home? before Naomi told her daughters-in-law to return home. If you look at the text, she pushed them away twice. And they had gone some distance, and this is where the question is coming from. How far? Was it just outside the door of their home? And she said, oh, go back to your mother's house. Or was it like three or four houses down the road? And she said, go back. Or was it like outside of the village? No, no one was looking. Then. She said, go back. How far did they go? And she did it twice. Naomi told them to go back, and, and Ruth and, and Orpah said, no, we'll go with you. And then they went on a little bit. And then she said, go back. And then Orpah turned around. Orpah didn't turn around on the first, when she was, when they were first told to go home. So for the, for the, for the natives, Pacifica natives, Opa did not betray Naomi. Naomi told them the first time, and Opa said, no. Both of them said, no, we are going with you. The second time, she said, she didn't say anything, actually. She just went. But then, you know, how far do you go along with someone who doesn't really want you to come? But the point, the main point for the, for, for the Pacifica, uh, natives where the main point was that Opa did not betray uh, Naomi when she went home. And if you look at commentaries, most of them have this, this idea that Opa was a betrayer because Ruth was, a, was loyal. So the question, the, the, the implication of this question is how can Ruth be loyal without saying that Opa <clears throat> was therefore a betrayer? The first, fourth question, with whom did Naomi and Ruth stay when they reached Judah? The natives, obvious, they went to their home, who, the home that they left with someone. They went, that's where they stayed. And they, therefore, had stayed, most likely, with others, the people who stayed, who looked after their home. Those people would have seen Ruth go out in the morning to go gleaning. Those people would have seen Ruth come back with that, you know, with that pile of food and seeds and the leftover from lunch. Those people would have seen Ruth go to the threshing floor at night, you know, clean up, smelling nice and pretty, and then go out. Those people 
would have seen her come back early in the morning. She left the threshing floor, according to the text, before anyone could see her going. But by the time she got home, the people would have known if they were natives. So these are questions, this is the question important to native readers, not necessarily, not so to the narrator and not to Western scholars. I'll finish with this question. Uh, in the field, when Boaz first met Ruth, who was fishing for whom? Obviously, someone was fishing. Was it Ruth fishing for Boaz, or was it Boaz fishing for Ruth? Or were they fishing for each other? And it's important, in, you know, whoever is fishing, to know whether Boaz was married, how many wives. And did he live in the plantation, or was he in, lived in the city? was according to the story, when Ruth arrived, he was in there. He came back from the city. So did he live in the plantation? And, and this was brought up, there's a reference in the text, when the young man who took care of the, who was in charge of the workers, when uh, Boaz came back and asked, you know, to whom does this young lady belong? He said, oh, this, this young woman, you know, she's been here. Uh, for a while working very hard, except that time she went into the house. So that house, what was that house? Was it Bo where Boaz lived? And why would, why did Ruth go into the house? Or did he live there when he's in the plantation, but his family were in the city? I mean, these are questions that natives, the, the natives ask in our Bible studies, and I explore in my, uh, in my project. And I invite you to think of these five questions uh, as you look at Ruth again. I want to finish with some artwork. Von Car Karlsfeld, uh, early 19th century uh, German artist, present uh, Naomi and Ruth walking away. And the lady whose back is to the viewer, is Opa, looks much older. She's got a cane, whereas the other two are walking away like they are youngish or younger. Not clear which is Ruth and which is Naomi. Is Naomi on the left or the one on the right? You decide. But in this particular work, the, the, these two, Naomi and Ruth, are walking not to the viewer, but in front of the viewer, and the viewer is invited to identify or at least recognize them and not care about the other woman who was walking around. The second image is uh, Gustave Dore, uh, who is a Bible illustrator from the middle of the 19th century. Um, Opa is walking with her hands down on her head, disappointment whereas Naomi and Ruth are in each other's arms, and which is Naomi or which is Ruth, we're not clear. But at least they are, they are not moving, they are at a standstill, and they are, they are inviting the attention of the viewer. So in these two European works, the story is about Naomi and Ruth, and we are invited by both the story and the text as read by scholars to read for Ruth and Naomi. I showed both images to my in my Bible studies around the region. And this is a drawing from the Bible study in Solomon Islands. Ruth and Naomi are walking away, but Opa is walking towards the viewer. And in this artwork, it wants us, the viewers, to see Opa, to see the text through the eyes of Opa. She's obviously crying, and she has her hands up this way. This is a sign of disappointment in the Solomon Islands and in other 
parts of the Pacific as well, people will walk away like this. It's a native drawing, it doesn't have the, the sophistication of the other two artworks from the 19th century, but this is inviting us to view the text through the eyes of Opa. And this one is from Fiji. Naomi does not look like a native Fijian, more European than native. She is walking away with a bag of money. Her back is to a chest of wealth, jewelry in Moab. Moab was not a bad country. It was a place where Naomi, according to this drawing, built her wealth and she walked away with some. And she's pushing away with her hand. And there's another arm, a soft, gentle hand holding on to her right hand, pushing away. And for this group, it's a group work, uh, that's the hand of Ruth wanting to go along. But if you see at the bottom of the work, there's a, on the left corner at the bottom, there's a kind of ruggedy uh, hand that looks like the hand of a native. And this artwork is actually inviting us to look at Naomi and Ruth through the eyes of Opa. So this is what a native, what native eyes see. It sees Opa and it sees the story through the perspective of Opa. And that's what my project is about. And that's what I'm inviting you to consider as you read not just Ruth, but other biblical texts. I hope you stay safe uh, during this difficult time. Thank you.